Welcome to the Crownsman Podcast. This is episode 10. Salut. They're adding up already. Um, this this show is going to be all about getting minds off the ground. I'm your host, Jared Downey, and beside me is my lovely co-host, Gaudi Molina. Good morning. How are you this morning? I am very good. I'm actually super energetic. We had um, a giveaway this morning of a pair of cat footwear. Work yeah. Boots. Yeah, we have a uh, we have the Crowns and Podcast group on Facebook, so we do promos and uh, giveaways and that, yeah. that sort of thing in there. Actually, show the boots. We got them under the table, so these are not up for this prize, but these yep. are. Uh, we gave these away this morning, so it was a lot of fun. We had yes. a lot of people into the draw. You know, you could tag someone. You know, those types of things. They came in. It was a lot of fun, um, and thanks, Cat, for sponsoring the show. Uh, Getting mines off the ground is going to be is a is a big topic because mines definitely have a challenge right now. Um, they're facing things like they're trying to compete against tech companies just to raise capital. Uh, the the social and the environmental challenges they're they're dealing with, the red tape um, uh, to get a mine off the ground is is very. What was that? It's shut off. Oh. <laughs> Our beautiful logo is. Oh, disappeared. there it's back. Um, and how do how do how do mines gain uh, public and and investors trust? So there there's a lot lot to cover. We're also going to talk about um, you know how the the process of actually getting the mine off the ground. We have um, Moro Chiesa coming in yes. to join the show. Um, stick around to hear his interview because Moro he has worked in this industry a long time and he's very blunt. And so we're, I'm going to talk. We're going to talk a little bit about Moro in a, in a few minutes. Uh, for those of you who haven't watched the Crownsman podcast before, and you know it still is a fairly new show, so you might be tuning in for the first time. The show is really has a really simple goal. We want to give a voice to industry, and to do that, we want to bring in experts. We want to look at government policies. We want to look at challenges that the industrial sectors are facing. And we cover everything. We actually have them in the pictures in the background. Um, you know, mining, construction, energy, forestry, agriculture, you know, big, all those big, heavy transportation. industries. Transportation. I knew I'd miss one. <laughs> I try. I try. I, I literally practice almost every day to try. And I still, <laughs> when the cameras come on, I miss one. Um, so that's really what we're trying to do. Just give a voice to industry. Um, Moro is Definitely, he is. Uh, he specializes in the financing side. Um, but actually, Gaudi, can you can you have bring up his bio and just yep. talk a little bit about about who he is, so people have an idea uh, of who who's coming on the show. So Mauro Chiesa is an advisor uh, with 36 years of financing and advisory services in the fields of extractive and infrastructure projects. Sorry, this has included four years in Ottawa with Export Development in Canada. 13 years in New York City with two international banks specialized in interna uh, industrial finance. 10 years with the World Bank Group, uh, primarily with IFC. And mm -hmm. 10 years as an independent advisor and consultant in Vancouver. Um, he actually has an MBA and a BA from the University of British Columbia. That is Mauro Chiesa. Yeah. And uh, I, I met Mauro about 10 years ago. I think it was at CIM, I think, uh, is where I saw him. It's 10 years ago. It seems crazy that it was that long. But um, he was speaking, and where I really noticed him is he was up there with a panel um, because it was the, you know, the show was done. It was the day after the show, so there's some panels and stuff that they were doing. And he was talking about kids being on their smartphones, and you're talking to them. I think at that time he was calling them a BlackBerry. And... Uh, you're talking to them about what you need and what they need to do, and um, you they're they're sitting on their phone, and he and him going, well, uh, are you listening? And the kid going, yeah, yeah, I, I just did everything you said, and um, but he was talking about it in a way that he he liked it, that he he liked um, the new technology and how amazing he he was talking about how mines are going to use holographic images to design mines and build them. Um, and I remember distinctly some of the there was I don't remember who it was, but there was a, a guy who was considerably younger than than Moro, and he was um, kind of rolling his eyes at him. And sure enough, this was actually about two days ago. I saw um, one of the major mines. 
at one of their videos, and they were showing, for sure enough, all holographic sort of <laughs> images. And that is so cool. Yeah, so he's very he's very forward thinking. And he, he gives it to you very straight. And I remember being, because I was, I was young, I was probably the youngest person at that whole event and being quite nervous because I hadn't really met people in the industry. So I, I kind of made my way through the crowd and met him. And he was very gracious and kind. Um, and we've actually kind of been, been friends ever since. So it was, it was nice to have him come on the show. Um, before we get into talking a little bit more about the industry, as you see behind us, You'll, you'll see some cat boots. Uh, you saw the ones that we did at the yeah. giveaway. We, uh, we have quite a bit, yeah. Yeah, cat, is, they send us so many boots. Yeah. <laughs> we but have it's boots to give away. Yes. They're so, so nice. Hey, they're, they're very comfortable. Um, so let's, we're going to do a contest, actually. We are, yes. Yeah. So can you, can you outline what that's going to be, Gaudi? Um, okay, so we're going to run a contest. Um, in, in order to enter, super simple, you can uh, f- subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, Crownsman Partners. Leave us a comment. Um, another way is you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all at Crownsman P. You don't have to do all three of them, all mm-hmm. three platforms. Just one is fine if you know you prefer Instagram or prefer prefer Facebook, whatever yeah. whatever it is. Um, that also uh, gets you entered to to win a pair of cat footwear. And I guess in the screen you'll put all the uh, yes. You'll see um, our handles on the screen. Yeah, because they are sometimes different, right? Like LinkedIn is different than Instagram. No, I think. no. No, they're Instagram, all same? Facebook, and LinkedIn is all at Crownsman P. Um, YouTube is Crownsman Partners, of course. Um, yeah. But yeah. And the way that the the thing uh, I was going to say about the the way you have why you have to comment, subscribe to our YouTube uh, and, channel, and leave and us comment a comment because we sometimes we don't see who's subscribing. If we have the comment, you know, it doesn't yeah. have to be that you subscribe. Just say something. Uh, about the show or, or whatever you want, ask a question, and then at least we we, we know we have, that yeah. you you've engaged, and then you can enter in the draw. That's what right. are they going to win? That's what everybody cares about. We're well, yeah. talking talk about our accounts. A My pair apologies. Of, of cat footwear, <laughs> which actually are the. Uh, could you, you bring them out? Yeah. yeah. So these are the ladies. Yes. Um. Yeah, I'll talk about those first while I get the <laughs> other ones. Okay, so these are the ladies because we both we have both men and women. Um, so these are the ladies, which are, and I will actually tell you right now because I have them right here. Um, they're Driverse six-inch waterproof work boot, also steel toe. Um, I know you guys can't see them, but I love this. I love it's a little tractor and oh it's yeah. a steel toe, and it's it's just so cute. Um, so that's one pair. The other pair are these right here, ex- Excavator XL eight-inch waterproof as well, composite toe, not steel toe. Electric hazard, insulated, puncture resistant, uh, slip resistant. So these are the, and these are for men. Yeah. And I haven't tried on the ladies' shoes. I'm going to be honest. I haven't tried them on. (laughs) (laughs) And I've also never heard a pair of work boots called the cute. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't say the boot was work. No, no, no. I said the little image here. I really like that. It's very cute. But my point, <laughs> my point is they are also very, very comfortable. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the the days of work boots not being comfortable <laughs> when it comes to cat are far, far over. They're, um, Jared did not try the women's. I did. <laughs> And <laughs> Let me clarify that. And they are very comfortable. Yeah, so all people have to do is they just they go comment or subscribe. We'll That's see right. it, and they'll enter into the draw. Absolutely. And then towards the end of the month, we'll we'll do the draw or towards the next show, or we'll announce it. We'll also announce it in the Crownsman Podcast group. Yeah. Um, but, of course, you know, we can only have two winners. Um, right. So if you don't win, Kat is still offering you 20% off all Kat footwear. Um, so you go on to their website, catfootwear.com, I believe th- I'm uh, that's correct. It's catfootwear.ca, it's .ca. actually. Catfootwear.com will take you to the Canadian site. But but yeah, but it's definitely catfootwear.ca um, uh, until December 31st. So, you know, if you're looking Christmas presents, shopping, mm-hmm. this is the time to do it. 20% off using CRWCAT. Yeah. That's the code at checkout. Yep. Um. Yeah, though it's it's really exciting to have them as sponsors. And they, this is actually uh, this is actually a Wolverine Worldwide company. That's right. They yes. have the licensing to Cat. So to give you an idea of um, 
who they have. They have hush puppies. They send us a pair of shoes. <gasps> We're wearing them now. So Which, by the way, I've never actually um, had a pair of hush puppies. I have neither, to be honest. They are so comfortable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they are really <laughs> I ne- comfortable. I never buy shoes for comfort. I was telling Jared that um, this morning. And when I put these on, I was like, wow. Yeah. Like, these are so soft. We got to get them to do the promo code. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll try to get them to do a promo code for them. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, this is this is an industrial show. They're doing yes. the, the shows for the cat boot. So catfootwear.ca and the, the promo code. It, I think it's in the front, too, yes, right? Yes, we'll, we'll put it in there. Yeah. So we're going to get into um, a little bit more about the industry. And I'm not going to spend too much time on it because I want to get to the in- interview with Moro. Um, but I'm just going to give you a a sort of a, an overview of what goes into getting a mine off the ground. And the reason is uh, to, to really understand what we're talking about here, because this is not like uh, building a house. You don't pull out a perm with a city, which can also be a challenge. Imagine uh, building a skyscraper, the challenges of doing that times 10. It takes about 10 to 15 years, sometimes longer for a mine to get off the ground. So it's really challenging. Um, so just, just to give you an idea of the initial step, this is just the taking the samples. This is like a phase one part. Mm-hmm. You take a sample. This is you know not hard in the environment. You're basically scraping up some dirt and seeing what's <laughs> there. Um, if there's something there, then you got to go to the local communities, the uh, the indi- local indigenous communities, the municipalities, and you have to get um, basically permits to go drill. If you get that, that's a big if. If you get that, then you go do a site survey um, as long as these communities are on board. Once you do that, you go in with your diamond drills and you get a drill sample. We actually have Energold coming on a show soon. Um, and they're going to be uh, talking about this particular part. So oh. that, yeah, so that's going to be interesting. So watch for that episode. Another reason to subscribe. Yes. And um, once you have the drill samples, then you have to develop the model. What's the mine going to look like? How are you going to uh, how are you going to facilitate extracting um, the minerals? Feasibility study is your. Are you going to make any money? That is the idea. Mm-hmm. Doing the show. And then after you do all that, and you think you're going to make money, you've got samples, everything looks good, then you got to go get your mining permits. And there's wow. a municipal, provincial, and federal levels of all that, plus dealing with the indi- indigenous communities, the rights if it's on their land or, or, or on um, their traditional ter- in their traditional territories. Some mines do it very well. Some, uh, I, I, I think uh, mines are starting to understand that they're not going to go and just, uh, you know, pay people off and get it done. There is a lot uh, that needs to go in it. You have to build relationships with the local communities um, to get it done and, you know, provide jobs. And so that all that's all in phase one. Now you get into phase two. So all the permits are in place. You're allowed to have your mine. <laughs> but now you got to determine what type of plant that you're going to have. Once they d- determine the plant type, the pr- type of process, then they've got to do water re- requirements. Again, that's a local thing as well because <clears throat> how much water are you going to take out? Then you get into the really interesting one, the tailings pond. This is where all the chemicals are used to extract. Um, now, if this is like a, um, a placer mining operation, you don't have the same amount. But if this is like heavy ore processing, you're going to have chemicals. And you, and since Mount Pauly in 2014... Mm-hmm. Uh, the restrictions, especially in British Columbia here, but I, I think all across Canada, I believe, um, the standards are, are going way up. You have to have your tailings pond up to date. Yep. Um, what a lot of people that don't really know about mine don't know is that, that from the tailings pond, it actually settles and that water gets reused, so it gets cycled through, right? Yep. Um, we're actually going to have uh, Lynn Angland yes. from Imperial Metals. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she's going to be ta- talking a little bit about Mount Pauly uh, in another epi- coming episode. So... Yeah, yeah, that's going to be an interesting people. <laughs> if you're, um, you know, the, the the media gave that so much uh, negative yeah. coverage um, that it's going to be nice to uh, sit with Lynn. I, I've met her before, and, and actually we did an interview with her before, but the sound got all messed up. And that's right. Yes, it was we really actually headed yeah. out to Quinnell for that interview. Yeah. Um, what show was that? Um, I believe that was like episode six. Yeah, but what was no, the show? What was the, the event six. called? That was the Quinnell Gold Show. The Quinnell Gold Show. Yes. Yeah. That was an awesome little uh, show that they put it on. It was, there. Yeah. yeah. So this is actually a redo um, of, for that, interview, of yes. that interview. Yeah. Um, 
after you do all the tailings disposal setup, then you got to find your equipment. Now, it, this is a uh, this is this is a whole topic in itself because the equipment can either be new or it can be used. Um, you you know we work with companies like Savannah Equipment. They're selling mostly the used equipment, but it, it really depends because some investors in the mines they want new. They want you know yeah. first grade brand new equipment. And some are more on a budget, so they want used. There's also st- times where you'll see like uh, it goes starts as an open pit mine and then it converts into an underground mine after a couple of years. Mm-hmm. So they'll switch from they'll get used equipment for the um, this is actually I learned from Morrow, um, and then it, it will convert after a couple of years into the underground. So you okay. go used and then new for the underground. Then you go into personnel. You got to get all your electricians, construction contractors, engineers. They all got to come in. You have all of your health and safety. The spotlight is on mining right now. Um, so the safety is a huge, huge thing um, for these sites. Then, once you <laughs> this is quite, this is a process to even talk through. <laughs> My goodness. Then you got to get your remaining permits. Wow. And then um, you may, in the last step, if it's exporting, you might even have to get additional permits just to get it off field. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. It's a lot of steps. 10, 15 years to, to make that happen. So you can imagine what that's like competing with a tech giant who comes blowing in within a couple of years and they've got this huge company. Yeah. Now you've got a mine that you're digging in, you've got people protesting it, and yes, you know, it's a lot of stuff to go. Yeah, it's a big challenge. Yeah. So, but everything in this room that we're using and the steel that we use, the cars we drive, Yes, the electric cars with their batteries, that's all from mining. That's right, yes. So you do need it. You do need it. But um, it it has some real challenges of getting them off the ground. So that's sort of a, a snapshot of the industry. I don't know how long it took to do that. We're, we're 18 minutes into the show. Yeah. So I'm going to expedite this forward. But that gives you an idea of uh, what the industry is. So we're going to cut now to uh, Mauro Chiesa, our interview at CIM. Yes. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. He is, I think the interview is about 25 minutes long or so. So, yeah, bear with it. Take the information. We just give you the snapshot. Absolutely. And he will give you the real information. And then we will cut back to us at the end of the episode. And we have our guest w- with us today, Mauro. Uh Pleasure Thank you for mine. joining. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you... I, I, I keep messing up your last name, so I'm... Chiesa. Chiesa, yes. yes. Church in Italian. <laughs> Church in Italian. That's yes, a, yeah. absolutely. Um, and we met almost... Th- Some time ago. Yeah. You almost were, 10 years ago. Yeah, you were speaking uh, at CIM. Yes. And uh, you, you had good information, and you weren't afraid to give your opinion. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, no, no. no. So say it isn't so... <laughs> And so when I was coming up with a... That's a what's been... <laughs> I, I, I was wondering what, what was wrong uh, with my delivery. Well, I keep on speaking my mind. Yeah, as long as it's the truth. And um, when, I, when I saw you speaking, um, you, you had good information uh, backing up what you were saying. Yes. And, and here at this show, we, we want real facts and real information. Well, we're trying not to get people to hold back. It's so. very good because the, the industry is in a turnaround. And uh, just as long as the industry keeps on learning from past mistakes, I think uh, it's, it's in for a good future. Uh, this, this episode here, um, we're talking about how to get mines off the ground. Now, it, within the show, we've talked about technology, we've talked about funding, we've talked about transitioning in, with new technology, challenges in, in the industry. Um, we had uh, Mr. Shapitka, he w- he's an MLA up in... Uh, uh, these Kootenays, mm-hmm. so we talked about the government's roles. We covered a lot of ground. At the end of the day, the mine has to get going. Get, get going. Yeah. Um, and so uh, you've worked with a lot of mining companies and, and getting them going, and you have quite a background. So I, 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 first of all, can we talk a little bit about your background, where you come from? Sure. Um, first of all, I worked uh, with EDC in Ottawa for four years. Then I went to Banque de Suez for seven in New York City. Then I worked with Sumitomo Bank uh, out of New York City as well, and did Candelaria and uh, a few other mining projects. Um, and then I went to the World Bank for 10 years. Mm. 
uh, and then I retired about 10 years ago, and uh, now I just look at mining projects on a selective basis. I just turned 65 two days ago, so I've been told to slow down by my doctor. Uh, well, happy belated <laughs> yes, birthday. happy birthday. Thank you. We would, we would, if we had known that, we would have had a little, yeah, little, a cake. little cake. Oh, what the... Yeah. Especially Gowdy. Yeah, Gowdy loves I, to throw her birthday parties. I do. <laughs> so we'll, we'll document it. We'll know by next year. When, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll go in a little bit more into the... So your roles with the banks, what, what were they? Uh, the World no, Bank? Uh, amaz- basically, in the World Bank, it was advisory because uh, that was a 95 to 2005 period. And all of a sudden, with the fall of the Iron Curtain all sorts of new opportunities came up and all the yield curve began to drop. Uh, so with low cost of funding and new markets, you found yourself with a kind of a, a whole new market situation. Up until 19, early 1990s, uh, the Iron Curtain uh, and vicious cycles basically created a boom-bust cycle. Uh, with the advent of Brazil, Russia, India, and China in the mid-90s, all of a sudden a new super cycle came in and the cost of funds dropped. So uh, all of a sudden you had all sorts of new countries that were all of a sudden vying to get their mining uh, activities going. Uh, but uh, you know, for one reason or another, their permits, their legal framework was well behind. So I worked uh, for 10 years advising countries on how to get their legal frameworks uh, going. Mm-hmm. And in one case, Mozambique, we, uh, we actually helped them sell their coal deposits mm. uh, uh, for a one-time development fee to Vale. So it uh, still involved a transaction advisory, uh, but it involved uh, basically getting mining laws up to world-class standards. And unfortunately, uh, Canada's fallen a little bit behind, mainly because Canada at one time was at the forefront. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, when you're at the forefront, your subsequent generations keep on thinking that they're at the forefront. Mm-hmm. And in the meantime, other countries have catapulted over us. And now we find ourselves a bit in a, in a catch-up mode. Yeah. Well, to, to be frank, um, one of the things that you just I just kind of tweaked to when you said that is looking around at the show, um, I'd say average age is probably 50 plus. You don't yes. have an influx of youth getting, and it is a great industry for, for innovation and technology, um, but I'm not seeing a lot, a lot of youth well, involved. Well, that's just it. Uh, mining used to be the place where, wow, you know, if you found, if you struck it, you found gold. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, precious metal. Silver, another brush. Nowadays, the fast money, the easy money, is found in high tech, in social media, and in numerous other applications. So mining actually has to compete now, right. not only for personnel, but also for capital with these new industries. Because you know, in 1995, there was no Google. There was no Facebook. There was no Amazon. Now, all of a sudden, these three companies represent 40% of the New York Stock Exchange, and they are worth gazillions. And this is what mining must compete with, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Uh, and yes, uh, I, too, uh, noticed the demographic, and I think, uh, you know, only time will tell. Only time will tell. Yeah. Well, I, well, one of the reasons we do this podcast is to push um, the industrial sector, not just mining, energy, um, transportation, construction. We, we focus on a lot of different mm-hmm. sectors, but, but is to, to promote that and showcase the, the developments that are happening in these industrial sectors. And, and probably our, our demographic is, is tilted a little bit towards a younger demographic, so we're hoping we can get more involvement. Um, you've had a lot of experience working with mines. What do you think right now is their biggest challenge in getting off the ground? Capital. That's, that's it. Capital. Because, again, the capital that they're competing for now all of a sudden says, hey, you know, if I can invest in Amazon or Apple or Facebook or Google, I can make twice as much money without the risk. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're focusing on metals, you've got 
you know, political risk, you've got uh, environmental risk, you've got uh, price risk. Uh, you know, uh, the all of a sudden the demand for for the metal might drop through the, the floor, right? Or it might be take off. But in the meantime, you've got just a lot more risks. So the, right now, the the challenge is to find capital simply because the capital that finds. You, also, I have to emphasize, capital nowadays, because of the low yield curve, the yield curve has been essentially negative for the last 10 years. The capital also wants to see dividends yeah. to satisfy the pensioners because there are more pensioners in the marketplace than ever before. So all of a sudden, if you want dividends as well as low risk, uh, boy, that's, that's, that's a challenge for a mining company. Yeah. What, I mean, is there any jumping, uh, we'll jump back and forth between operating mines and mines that are trying to get started. What are, what can mines do now that are operating? Um, uh, it's a two part question. Uh, what can they do to, what are the, or what are they doing to try to, to lower their costs? And, and, and what, what can they do to gain public trust? Because uh, that is something that's been challenged. Well, that's a, that's a complex question. Uh, yeah. let's, let's get into the cost reduction first. Um, they definitely could start by buying used equipment and being more selective. And I know that the salesmen from the, for the new equipment come up with all sorts of fancy offers and side gifts. But at the end of the day, you really, until you get that debt paid off or substantially paid down, you want to be as free cash flow as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, I use the term free cash flow carefully because it's not a generally accepted accounting term, but it's a generally accepted banking term. You just want to service your capital and leave as much cash flow after servicing your capital as possible. And one of the ways is to definitely get involved in, in used mining equipment. Secondly, and I've just come back from the Atacama, um, people have to start now looking at solar energy. The Chinese have brought down the cost of solar dramatically. Mm -hmm. And if your mine is between 35 north and 35 south, you really have to give solar energy uh, its due, due diligence. Uh, thirdly, um, mines have to piggyback or share Infrastructure. Now, you know, I can show you a road to a mine and I'll, I could keep track of the number of trucks that use that road. And I guarantee you that it will never be a percentage higher than 10%. So given the fact that many mines are in mining regions, it really pays for the mining company to see if they could share infrastructure, be it road, be it telephony, be it power, be it anything, just get that sharing process around. Because that only not only reduces costs, that also reduces the permits required, and that often re reduces the manpower required as well. Mm -hmm. And that's like a, a, a triple policy. Unfortunately, we still have a lot of egos in the industry who would prefer to have their own road. But, uh, you know, that's changing. And you're seeing with Gold Corp and uh, Tech now in Chile, there is precisely this uh, the sharing analysis going on. Is it also, uh, and I ask this with, with no knowledge of it, is it also um, when you're, you're getting permits and doing the mines because they're separate, it's a it's separate permitting for... Oh, oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. that's why I said it's, a, it's not only a cost reduction, but it's a permit reduction and a manpower reduction as well. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a triple benefit. Right, yeah. And... Sorry, I yeah. actually had a question. You were mentioning that now, you know, the industry has to compete with a lot of this new technology like Facebook yes. and Google. Is there a way for the industry to work and use the new technology? Uh, oh, yes, of course. But uh, at the end of the day, you still have metal price risk. You still have uh, construction risk. You still have uh, political risk. Uh, Google, unfortunately, is in Silicon Valley. Uh, it doesn't have political risk. Uh, Google can uh, can relocate, as uh, we've just seen with the uh, new European uh, Union uh, requirements. Google can, or Facebook can relocate 1.5 billion 
uh, clients out of Ireland and into elsewhere, into more politically uh, safe regions. Uh, unfortunately, mining cannot, uh, cannot do that. Thing. However, mining can take out EDC political risk insurance or from the World Bank uh, MEGA political risk insurance, and uh, that can definitely reduce the political risk substantially. How can they... How do how do mines gain more more public trust? Going back to that, the the second part of that question is, um, how do they do that? How, how do they start that's to a, attract the investors? That's a great question. Uh, the answer to which is you you've got to remember now that everybody is wired into the internet. Mm -hmm. Okay, the second some detractor does not like your answer, they can go into the net and you're a dead duck. So. The solution is simple. First of all, hold public meetings once a year, let's say, with the general public. And everybody and anybody is allowed in and can voice their opinions. Mm -hmm. That lets you anticipate any issues that might be brewing. Secondly, you hire as many locals as possible. Uh, leave the expats home. The locals, because it's their jobs, become your spy as opposed to a government spy. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, you want to basically get internally, you want to raise your community relations officer as high in the organization as possible. Often they are a manager that answers to the production department, which answers to a regional department, which ultimately answers to the CEO or CEO. Get that plugged into the COO immediately mm -hmm. so that the COO hears unequivocally what the complaints are or what the issues might be so they can anticipate. So with those three elements. I'm not saying it's a guarantee, but I'm saying is that you can win yourself a lot more public trust. Is it happening? Are you seeing yes, companies it starting oh, to do yeah. it? Uh, yeah. RTZ uh, has done a wonderful job. Um, BHP as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the Canadians less so, I must say. Yeah. Uh, do you, do you see, is it going to start, do you think? Or, it has they to. have to, right? It has to. It has to. And what's, what's the most important relationship? Because there's, there's the local communities, there's provincial. Uh, I'm talking specifically in Canada. Everybody. everybody at First every, Nations. Everybody. Everybody. Everyone's on the net nowadays. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just, I mean, there will always be issues, but at least you can anticipate them. And internally, uh, they can reach the senior decision makers as quickly as possible. Yeah. We had a, it was a, for a technology that was sensor, this was a, an iPad, and you take a picture of it, and it, it does all the, the sensory of what's, uh, of what's in the materials. Yes. And uh, he was talking about taking data. Data is one thing. At, at one time, it was all about how good the data is. Now it's moved into how fast can that data be communicated to the right area, and that's the primary, because we, we, we have data everywhere now. Everybody's got yeah. data, yes. Yeah, so, but data a week late, you know, yeah. if it's going across a conveyor or if it's going to communicate with the First Nations community it, and it's too that's late. Why, that's why that mining company has just got to get information sessions going yearly, if not semi-annually, then at least yearly mm -hmm. to just hear what the local impressions are. And by the way, uh, I can think of uh, one example very clearly. It was the Lundin mine in, uh, in DR Congo. And uh, it turned out that them hiring a lot of locals, they not only sent the expats home, but the locals turned out to be far better spies on Kinshasa, which was the national capital, than any hired firm. Why? The locals basically liked to send their kids to the expat school, the school or the, the expat staffed uh, medical clinic. I think it actually may have been you telling me a story once that there was there was a mine and they. Um, I'm sorry, oh. here, Mike. 
Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, you were. Tell I don't know if it was you, uh, but there was a. a it was a very. Uh, it was a very bad road. I think it was in Africa, and they they ended up paving. It was quite a few kilometers, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they connected these two cities, and they, that mine invested and. Uh, and I think they did put up a school and they did other things in that community. And that mine, uh, you know, all the security issues and that, it eliminated so many of yeah, their issues absolutely. because they made that investment into the community. Well, I'll, I'll go back to a prior example, solar energy. Uh, one mine has basically invested in solar energy and they have a little bit extra energy over and above their own needs. So they basically sold it for free or for cost to the nearby town. Women now have some power for their sewing machines and they can do a little bit of seamstress uh, or dressmaking. Kids can study at night, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's transformational. And all of a sudden, the political issues disappeared. Mm -hmm. Disappeared. And why? Because this mining company basically sold its excess power across the fence to the nearby town and at cost. And all of a sudden, everybody said, well, my God, you know, instead of waiting two, three, four years for the local utility to bring me electricity, this mining company is basically giving me electricity right away. Yeah. Again, it's, it's, a, it's an integrative model. You're no longer just a builder of a mine. You come in and you focus on your mine only. You have to reach out. You have to build a road or you have to fix up a couple of bridges or you have to you know, bring in some expats uh, into your medical clinic and into your schools and perhaps uh, you know, share the schools and the medical clinic with the, uh, with the children of, uh, of your employees. I, 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 now, we're talking about, if you're talking about markets where you can, there, there, there's a, that demand. Now, what can Canadian, what, what can, I mean, they're not, the, the, the demand for a school, electricity, that, that's not, so where, where can Canadian com mining companies that want to mine here in Canada, what can, what can they offer the public, or is it, is it the jobs, is that the? Uh, it's, it's the jobs. I mean, in, in Canada, we've got the schools, we've got the health system. Uh, what they can do better in Canada is um, pick up more of the infrastructure costs mm. and of the so environmental remediation costs. Uh, I don't think there is enough attention being paid yet to environmental remediation. Just to focus on and, and that communication with... Oh, with well, of course. Yeah. 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 No, just to sit down and once a year and you listen to people's gripes or listen to the issues firsthand and have it travel to the senior most level of the mining company That's would be, uh, be a, a, a massive improvement. Yeah. Oral, thanks for taking taking the time. Uh, we appreciate you coming in and uh, giving you. You've got a lot of lot more information, um, and I I don't want to cut you off. It, are there are there other topics that you you feel are? Yeah. Uh, first of all, you asked uh, what it takes to get a mine going, and uh, having been involved in this process recently, uh, I'd have to say that you know the mining company has to present itself better as a lower risk to the investment community. Uh, and there are lots of ways doing that. First of all, you know, unfortunately, Vancouver, a lot of Vancouver promoters are still involved in flipping projects. Mm -hmm. So they, they go looking for money. But if you're, if you're, we've got limited f funds for mining, the last thing you want to do is get used by a flip, uh, you know, strategy. So first of all, you're going to have to present yourself as an ongoing concern, as an operating concern. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, many investors now come armed with software that is current and it's, it's about as current as can be. So you're not going, they all know that everyone has cost overruns. Mm -hmm. So the important thing is to do is to, when you approach the market, Approach it once you've got the proven and probable figure up and you still have some upside remaining. So that means that you, know, you can hang your hat on the proven and probable 
And should there be cost overruns, well, there will probably be additional drilling coming up to, to mitigate that risk. And thirdly, you've, people have to get uh, used to the fact that permits can disappear in a, in a femtosecond, which is 10 to the minus 15th. Um, you have to look after your permits carefully. Mm -hmm. Don't assume that just because you got a permit, then all right, that's it. Sorry. Nowadays, you know, especially if a new government comes in, everybody would love to conduct a review and everybody would love to pull permits. So just be absolutely certain that you are well within you, the upper bound or the lower bound of that permit. Because once you start wandering a little bit too close to one of those two bounds, mm -hmm. you could be dead meat. Yeah, and, and you and you think that's a major is that now is that the major challenge in in any region or is that a Canadian? No, that's a, it's a major challenge in any region. You're seeing uh, many uh, jurisdictions now in Central America ban Canadian mining or ban mining outright, mm -hmm. uh, and that was by and large because under, under a prior regime the permit was obtained and then abused. Mm -hmm. So the new government comes in needs a gringo to beat up on, and all of a sudden, you know, there's somebody to be, by, uh, be beat up on. Which, uh, we support the industrial sector, but at the end of the day, that's, that's the company's fault for, for, not, for not taking at care of that. At the end of the day, that's, it's, it's the company's fault, yes. And uh, once, once that, you know, once that tube is out of the toothpaste tube, you, you can't get that uh, toothpaste tube, uh, you know, full again uh, with any, with any uh, ease. Uh, you talked about you talked about used uh, being yeah. being uh, a way to cut costs. What about and you talked about solar and I mean how how important is it for these these mines to start integrating technology in, into their process? This this German uh, pavilion over here has company has companies that have a lot of technology. There's autonomous uh, vehicles. You have Komatsu and Finning. They're talking. They're showing off their their equipment here. How important is that? Uh, Massive. It, yeah. It's, it's, it's again, look, everyone knows that there are cycles. It's just that we've already seen a change in, from one cycle to a super cycle and then to a super drought. And nobody really knows what the future will bring. Mm -hmm. Yes, in 20 years' time, there will be 9 billion people mm -hmm. on the face of this earth, half of whom will want to own cars. And 100 years ago, there was one and a half billion people and nobody owned cars. So, you know, we are going into new demand cycles. But the bottom line is get your costs down. Mm -hmm. Absolutely get, get your costs down. Get your free cash flow up. Get those costs down any which way possible. Sharing infrastructure, solar energy, high technology, driverless trucks if, uh, you know, that that can be imagined, but who knows what the future will bring. And then communicate out with the public and allow oh, the voice shit, to come yeah, in. Yeah, 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 yeah. And hire locally, hire and train locally as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, I just can't emphasize that enough. Yeah. There's still too many expats in this world. Yes, we've got a lot of engineers in Canada that would love to work elsewhere, but other countries are catching up as well, yeah. and uh, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to to work at uh, at, at many mines. Yeah, and uh, once you hire that local, believe me, you have the best local diplomat you can find. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, thank you very much for joining the world. Not at all. Thanks for watching, everyone. Uh, remember to subscribe on YouTube, Crownsman Partners. Leave a comment to enter to win mm -hmm. a pair of cat footwear. Um, also follow us, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. That's at Crownsman P, and you'll see our handles at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you didn't win uh, a pair of cat footwear, you can still purchase at 20% off at catfootwear.ca um, using CRW Cat. Um, at checkout. We've got our own special promo for the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so thank you. Thank you again for watching the Crownsman podcast. 
we want to give a voice to industry, but ultimately the businesses that supply the industries, build the mines, build the pipelines, do the construction, they and the people that work in it are the voice of industry. So thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting us. And thank you for Kat for sponsoring the show. And yeah. thank you, Gowdy, for co-hosting with me today. And thank you, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you.